All right. I have a little bit of uh, the introduction is a little longer on this than normal, um, but I don't know how many points there are to this. <laughs> but there's a bunch of points. The points are scripture. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to tell you when I'm transitioning to the next point. I just lose track of how, because there's a lot of points, because this is a theology, a biblical basis for healing. Uh, we've talked about how to get words of knowledge. We, well, basically, I just very quickly said you can feel them, you can think them, you can see them, you can read them, you can say them, you can uh, interpret an unusual experience and dream them. Seven ways you can get a word of knowledge. Uh, actually, I only had somebody tell me that in five minutes, and within a week, I started having words of knowledge. And no one laid hands on me. All, I had, all they did was tell me how to recognize them. Here's what they said. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. You cannot be a... That's why Pentecostals don't ask evangelicals if they have the Holy Spirit. That is a dumb question. It's dumb because even Pentecostals believe you receive the Spirit at regeneration. You're born of the Spirit and you're sealed and indwelt with the Spirit. What you're really meaning to ask is, have you been filled or baptized in the Spirit? It's not the same question as, or as do you have the Spirit? Because Paul said in Romans chapter 8, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Him. And so when an evangelical, here's a Pentecostal or charismatic, ask him, do you have the Spirit? They feel judged. Are you questioning whether or not I'm a Christian? Because I can't be a Christian if I don't have the Spirit. Now let's go a little bit farther with that. That means if he, the Holy Spirit is in you because you've been born again, then you actually... He has all the gifts, and he's in you. Before you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can move in gifts. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not the gateway to the gifts, but it's like the supercharger of the gifts. It's like the... Um, it's like... I know what I'm trying to say... Um, Turbocharger, yes, but that's not it. Steroids. That's what I was looking for. It's like the gift on steroids. You know, it's like when the Holy Spirit comes, there is an enhancing and, an, and, and, and taking it to a, a higher uh, degree. And, um, and, and, by, and by the way, I do believe, because I've seen it so many times. For, for, let me give you this illustration like for Heidi Baker. When, what happened to her, and then she started having these hundreds of churches that started, and all this stuff started happening. Then two and a half or three years later, I was in Beira in Mo, Mozambique, and the Spirit of God came on her again, and she hears again the Lord say, this time, audible voice, not hundreds of churches and thousands of people. This time, he said, thousands of churches and millions of people. And she told me that was easier to believe than the first one, because the first one was impossible. But when the impossible became possible, then it was, she had faith to believe for the truly impossible. And they actually do have 10,000 churches and over a million people come to the kingdom now. But she was touched another time there. She was not flat. She was drunk. She had never been like that in Mozambique. The Lord would only do it to her outside of, the United, outside of Mozambique because there was a, a control issue in the West that wasn't present in Mozambique. And... And, uh, and then another time we were with her, and uh, she and I were the two speakers at Ludenscheid, Germany, at a large uh, charismatic Pentecostal gathering. And um, we had to wheel her out on a cart, you know, because she couldn't walk. And, uh, and in each of these times, there was an increase of the anointing on her life, an increase in the, how much she was seeing. And so I think it's, the thinking that the one experience of being baptized in the Spirit, and that's it, keeps, keeps us from knowing there, there could be more. And sometimes a later experience after your initial baptism can be more powerful than your initial baptism. Because if we don't think that, then we think this is it. This is the zenith of what I can have. But my experience with talking to people and watching the lives of people who were Pentecostals is like, I don't think I shared. Did I share with the guy from Honduras? Uh, he was a Pentecostal. I think I did. But anyway, I'll just reiterate it. 
this guy was a Pentecostal missionary. I think he was Assemblies of God, but I'm not sure. But I'm almost certain because I was in Assembly of God Church and there's a lot of uh, where we were at in Oklahoma City. And uh, when we prayed for him, he later I found out uh, a couple of months later, I think it was, that he had seen more in two months than he had seen the preceding, I don't know, it was eight years or 25 years now, I forgot. I got to go back and try to listen and see what I can remember. Um, but he's seen more healings in two months. And his the theology didn't change. He already had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He spoke in tongues and, and everything you're supposed to do in the Pentecostal church. He had those markers. But then after this experience, he saw more in two months than he had seen in the first eight to 25 years. So I really want to encourage us to believe that you know there could be more. Um, but... I want to, I want to uh, share with you a little bit is about this biblical basis of healing that we're going to look at. Uh, I also want to challenge you to, to step outside your comfort zone. That's the, what my introduction is going to be about, stepping outside your comfort zone. And I remember when the first time I preached this message, I had studied F.F. F. Bosworth's book, Christ the Healer. And this was in 1994, first time I preached this message. And I would studied his book and uh, for a over and over and over, and basically took his, his book as the uh, basic outline of this message. And, and I felt comfortable teaching content. You know what I'm saying? Teaching information. And uh, believing that that would cause faith and God would stir things. But then um, I was in Toronto in 94 um, and at the Catch the Fire conference. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you're comfortable with word of knowledge and you're comfortable praying for people with words of knowledge. But I want to do more than, what I, than just words of knowledge. And I want you to tell the people tonight that you're going to pray for anybody that wants to be prayed for. And there's about 5,000 people there. And John Arnott said, don't you do that. You'll be here all night. I said, I think it's the Lord. He said, well, do, do what you want, but I'm just warning you. And, and, and John was wrong, by the way. I wasn't there all night. I was done by five, and daylight was about an hour away. So I, <laughs> I, I, I had an hour to spare. And, uh, but I'll never forget, there was a woman, and today I believe she's the leader of the hub in Chicago. This, this organization has been going on for 20 some odd years uh, for renewal, but she had been unable to sleep through the night for, I, I think over about 20 years because her shoulder would start hurting. It would wake her up multiple times in a night and she was getting terrible sleep. And so I miss, you know, cause I usually get, I was usually getting in bed by one then. So I only missed four hours sleep and she gained sleep because she went to bed that night and slept and that shoulder's never bothered her since. And she's able to sleep through the night. And it was just an amazing thing. But it was actually scary to me to step out and say, I'm not comfortable praying for people that just, just praying for them. That was stepping outside of my comfort zone. So uh, a month later or so, I'm at Mod Auditorium getting ready to bring this message for the very, very first time. Comfortable with the content and it's just a few minutes before I get up to speak, I had this impression. Tell the people I'm going to heal them as you teach the word. The teaching of the word is going to cause a faith to come and I'm going to heal them. And I want you to tell them that they will feel my presence come upon them. Not everybody, but some. There's a sovereignty to this I don't understand. But he said, when they feel my power come upon them that they're to stand up until you see them. And when you see them, you're to say, I bless you in the name of Jesus. And then they sit back down. At the end of your sermon, then you must inspect because it doesn't take any risk to just do it without getting feedback. You got to get feedback. People need to know, were you right or not? Did it happen or not? Don't play it safe. Take a risk. And uh, I, I thought, well, Lord, if that's not you and I do that and it doesn't happen, I'm going to look really bad. And I felt like the Lord said, if you really believe it's me, you got to obey. 
And I said, well, Lord, I'd rather miss trying to obey because you look at my heart and you're going to understand I'm not rebelling against you. I'm tr- I miss, if I miss, it's only because I thought it was you. I actually at one time thought God would keep me around longer because I was humorous to him. And it, you know, in the, midst of, in the midst of the Trinity, the Father would say to the Son, I'm going to let him live a little longer. He's just, you know, if he thinks it's me, he'll go for it. You know, sometimes it's not me, but I like watching, you know. You know. <laughs> and with, but, but with all seriousness, I was really with fear and trepidation, trepidation. I was scared. What if this isn't God? I got two-thirds of the way through the sermon and no one has stood up. And the longer I'm going, the more nervous I'm getting. And then they began to stand. And before the night was over, there were several scores of people who had been healed because I did inspect at the end. And I remember one time, the, the most, the longest it ever went, I was down to the last point and I was down into the last few minutes of the sermon and no one had stood up. I was in a big assembly God church down in Florida. And finally, they began to stand up on the very end and, uh, uh, and they were healed. But I would like to say, that now, since 1994 to this day, I've never preached this message without somebody getting healed. Now, how many of you are pastors that's here? Do we have any pastors left? Okay, let me tell you something. Every person that's traveled with me for quite some time that's preached this sermon took it. Now, I, I basically took the outline from F.F. F. Bosworth. So I'm not taking credit for the content in a sense of, I'll take credit for the illustrations, but not really the content because I studied and studied. But when I preached it, I saw it happen. And the people who traveled with me saw God be so faithful that when they taught it, the same thing happened. As a matter of fact, at one point, there was a couple from the East Coast, Philadelphia area, both had been uh, air traffic controllers in their mid-50s and had retired from being uh, air traffic controllers. They are not ministers. And they said, we'll pay our own way. Let's travel with you. I said, okay. I did that for several people. I can't do it anymore because I have people traveling with me already. But then uh, I, I had people who did that. And every one of them became full-time ministers before afterwards uh but anyway uh we were in uh, i was in assembly god church in australia and the meetings were so exciting i felt like we needed to extend it one more night but i was supposed to be the next night at a roman catholic church saint uh, thomas uh, the roman catholic church saint thomas the apostle roman catholic church in canberra the capital of australia and, uh, and so I said to the, the air traffic controllers who were not yet in ministry, later on I would license and ordain them, but at the time they were not in ministry, and they went ahead of me. And when I got there, they'd already preached three times. And they had preached on a uh, five-step prayer model. They'd preached on how to have words of knowledge, and they preached on the biblical basis of healing. I said, oh, biblical basis of healing? Oh, man, I wanted to teach that. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I, said, I said, well, how'd it go? And he said, just as if you'd been here. I said, well, tell me. He said, no, Randy, we watch God be so faithful that we just believe that it's his word is what he's backing up. And if we would just preach what we've heard you preach, because you're just preaching his word, he'd do the same thing. And, and they had healings. I honestly believe you take the word and teach the word and he will back it up, especially if you have faith to believe it and if you'll say it. Say, well, what if I'm wrong? What if it does? You'll be humbled. Do you know humiliation is good for humility? (laughs) But you'd be surprised how much you're, if you believe it strong enough to say it, how important that is. And if you're wrong, just be humiliated. Like I said, it's good for humility. (laughs) <laughs> so after that first time I preached it at Mott Auditorium which is uh, where Cheon was at at the time I was so excited because I'd never been in a sermon I never preached a sermon that resulted in the sermon itself while the sermon's going on people started getting healed that's was, that was the first time I'd ever had that happen so the next church I'm at is El Shaddai Guatemala City it's a 5,000 member church 
uh, Harold Caballeros is pastor of it. And I, I got there and I said, Lord, that was so much fun. Can we do that again? Can, can, can I preach that again? And then I thought, you know, most of the time we say, Lord, if it's your will, show me. And so I thought, I'm not going to pray that way. I said, Lord, if it's not your will, tell me. If you don't want me to do that again, tell me. Because if you don't tell me not to, I'm going to. <laughs> That's a different way of praying. Most of the time we pray the other way. Lord, if it's your will, tell me. I said, Lord, if it's not your will, tell me. Because if you don't say something, I'm going to do it. And I was in the introduction, and this woman stood up over here on my right. She's very wealthy. And it was a, it was, at that time, they didn't have their building. It's just a tent. And, she's, uh, um, and I saw her, and she stood up right in the introduction. And, and, and the sermon's an hour long. Um, and with Spanish translation, now it's two hours long. So uh, she stood up, and I, I saw her, and I said, Yo bendiga en el nombre de Jesus, and bam, she hit the floor and shook for two hours. Uh, she was supposed to have a hysterectomy uh, that day with both the uterus and the both ovaries taken out. And because she had um, uh, a tumor the size of a grapefruit in the womb, in the uterus. She went back to the doctor the next day and she, because she had canceled her surgery and was supposed to have it the next day because she just said, I'm going to give God one chance, one more, one more day before I go. I really, this is going to be the first night. I, I want to go to this. I believe God could heal me. And uh, she goes back and the doctor's upset. She said, she, of course, she, if she'd been a poor woman, she would be missing parts today. But she wasn't poor. And the doctor said, that's a waste of time. That's a waste of money. She said, well, it's my money. I don't want you because I believe I've been healed. And he was upset. And Carol, Harold, the pastor, said, my wife goes to the same um, obstetrician or gynecologist, and, and he doesn't believe. And he finally checked her. And he said, oh, brought her in. He said, this is a miracle. And he wrote a miracle on her chart. And he said, yesterday you had a large fi uh, fibroid tumor the size of a, um, a grapefruit. And today is, there's nothing there. I saw her five or seven years later in another country in Latin America, and she had never had another fibroid since she was healed. Well, by the way, if how many, those of you are pastors, do not take your administrative assistant or your secretary with you uh, if you go with a team. Don't take your secretary or your administrative assistant with you on these types of trips. Uh, that's just wisdom. I made the mistake. I took my administrative assistant with me with about four or five other people on a team uh, to, to Guatemala City is this, <laughs> the same trip. And uh, at the end of the trip, my assistant came up to me and said, um, I'm letting you know I'm giving you my two weeks notice right now. <laughs> I quit. I said, what do you mean you quit? I said, she said, I know now why, you, why you're so excited all the time. I understand why you love doing this. How can I remain your administrative assistant? Because on this trip, I prayed for a young man who was totally blind and his eyes were open. And after you see the blind eyes open, you can't just be an administrative assistant anymore. I'm going to come down and go and learn Spanish and I'm coming to the mission field, which she actually did. I lost my administrative assistant because what? Just, just one blind he's, guy. Well... In 1999, I went to uh, Brazil for the first time, and I was speaking to the four-square Pentecostal denomination, a, 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 a thousand of their um, pastors. There's a, uh, it was for the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, I was teaching this sermon, and it started out slow. Eu aben soy nome de Jesus, eu aben soy nome de Jesus, eu aben soy nome de Jesus. And then about halfway through the sermon, so many people started standing up. And, it was, and there was no carpet. And it, was, it was so loud in there. It was one of those really live rooms with no sound absorption. And the excitement became so great with the numbers of people getting healed. And I couldn't say it. I was just, Ayo, I've been so in that I lost control of the meeting. 
I had a microphone, but you couldn't hear me. I mean, the, the noise was so loud with the excitement of everybody getting healed. And I turned around to the president of the four square denomination of the state of San Paulo and said, I've never had this happen before, but I've lost the meeting. I mean, they can't hear me. And so I had a team of, I think it was 11 on the team. I said, okay, let's just go pray for them. So we and, and had theater seatings. We're climbing across. We're praying for people. And for about, you know, I'd already gone. It was like a two-hour teaching because of going into the Portuguese. And, um, and so for about 45, after the first hour, halfway through, because we're going two languages, we then were just praying for 45 minutes. It finally dialed down enough. That, then I came back and finished the sermon. And one of the things I discovered sometimes when God wants to make a point, something that's really important to him, it's, it's like in, on that point, more starts getting healed. Now, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens quite a bit. So this is one of my favorite sermons to teach. Having said that, though, it's been a while since I've had a chance to, uh, to teach it. When we start out looking at uh, the scriptures... I want to draw our attention to one I didn't have in the, in the original message, but it's from Exodus chapter 12, and it's about the Passover lamb. And uh, it, this is one of the earliest teachings uh, uh, about healing. Now, our next text will be Exodus 15, but this is actually before Exodus 15, Exodus 12, and it's, again, it's about the Passover lamb. Now, we, we really get this part. We really understand in the connection between Passover and the Lord's Supper. We understand that the Lord's Supper became to the New Testament people of God what Passover was to the Old Testament people of God. And the, the, the crucifixion, resurrection is the center point of salvation history for the Christian. And Passover is one of the greatest events for the Jewish people. And we understand the typology really, really well when we understand that the cup represents the blood of Jesus. Because he said, this cup is a new covenant and my blood was shed for many for the remission of sins. So we understand that. And we understand that as because of what he did that we can be saved from each, um, Saved from destruction, saved from damnation, saved from eternal death. Because when I see the blood, I will pass over where you get the word Passover. And so the firstborn didn't die. And we understand that that was a typology. Jesus is the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. And we understand that his blood is the means of without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So we really get the connection to the cup. What a lot of Christians don't get and miss is the connection to the body. Because not only in the Lord's Supper is there the cup that's blessed, but there's also the, the, uh, the bread that's blessed. And that night, not only was there a deliverance from death, but there was a major healing that took place. In Psalms uh, 105, verse 37, it's translated different ways. It says, uh, and by the way, they believe that 2 million people, most commentators believe that 2 million people came out of Egypt in the, in the Exodus. And we know today that if you have better food, better job, less stress, Better sanitation, you have better health. But what could be worse than being a slave? It's for the way you're treated, quality of life, sanitation, food. And this is the slaves. They have been put into slavery for 400 years. And two million of them come out, the Hebrew children. And Psalms 105 verse 37 says, and there was not one feeble one among them. One translation says, there was not one sick among them. Other translations say, and not one stumbled. And it was a meaning that they, it literally has a sense of they came out 
in divine health. My question is, that's not normal. I say that's not a question, it's a statement. I know it's a, I'm getting ready to ask the question. That's not normal. How is it that two million people could come out of every age group and there's no weak, feeble, sick, no one stumbles? How can that be? It's supernatural. There was not only a deliverance from the death, but there was a healing to the body that's represented in the Paschal Lamb, which is a type of Jesus Christ. And that's why I believe that Paul said in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that because they've not discerned the body, some have grown sick and weak and some have fallen asleep, a euphemism for died. Now, I know that many translators say, and it can mean this, and you know, there's lots of times that a verse can have more than one meaning. So lots of them say, because we've not recognized the body, because the, the, we won't recognize that our interdependence upon each other, we were denying ourselves. Matter of fact, my mentor, uh, Dr. John Ruth, when he teaches this, we, we, if you deny the gift in somebody else, then you're missing out on that. And that could be one of the reasons why uh, there was the sickness that was happening uh, you know, in the church. We weren't recognizing the gifts in everybody. And, and, and there was division that was going on. And, and you know, it can mean that because you don't discern the body, meaning the body of Christ, the local congregation. I also believe it can mean this. Because we do not discern the body of Christ in the sense that we do not discern like we discern the blood of Jesus, to discern the body of Jesus. If we do not discern that through his death, his shedding of his blood, there's forgiveness of sin, to understand in the same manner, in his body he bore our sicknesses and our diseases. In the, and the two Hebrew verbs in Isaiah 53, for bore and uh, took up uh, or, or bear, in English they changed the words from the way it's translated in the latter part of the chapter for our iniquities and our transgressions. Because the English translators, in my opinion, did not want us to, un to see how it's exact same verbs in Hebrew that dealt with dealing with our sins and sicknesses as, I mean, our sicknesses and uh, diseases as it was our iniquities and our sins. Let me say this. We have, more, we have more faith in his blood than we do his body. We have more understanding because there's been more teaching about his blood than there's been about his body. There's been more teaching about forgiveness than there has been about healing. There was a season in the history of the church where there was not a great confidence or assurance of salvation. But through the teaching of the word, we've, we're in a place where people seem to be able to come into great confidence and assurance of salvation because of the emphasis of the, script, of the teaching. I believe when we begin to have a better understanding of what happened in the Exodus and how it points to Jesus and all that he did for salvation and for healing, we'll have more faith and we'll see more healing take place. So, um, Marif, one, last, one last illustration before we get started. On. We are started, but I mean before we get into the rest of the text. Um, the last, the, the one of two t times I've seen somebody get healed of schizophrenia was in this message. And uh, there was a man there from a Southern Baptist church who of 8,000 at the meeting and uh, uh, he liked my teachings. He told me, I really liked listening to you. I, I never heard you before. I liked your teachings until you came to this sermon. And I, I'd be honest with you, this sermon offended me. I thought it was showy. I don't know why people had to stand up. And as they were standing up, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm thinking, well, how much of this is psychological suggestion? And he said, I had a whole bunch of things about this message I did not like. And as I'm frustrated at you when you got to this sermon as I'm frustrated all of a sudden I get this very strong impression stand up 
And I say, Lord, well, there's not, I'm not sick. And he said, if you're sick and you feel the presence, and I'm not sick, stand up. Lord, I, I, I don't even feel anything. He said, if I feel something, I don't feel heat, energy. I don't feel anything. I don't feel pressure, love. I, I, don't, I just don't feel your presence touching me at all. And he said, if, if you're sick and, and you feel that, I, I don't qualify. Stand up. Three times he heard stand up and he's, you know, he's arguing with the Lord. This can't be the Lord. You know. and, and then the next time he heard the word centurion. And he knew that it wasn't about him. It was about his stepdaughter who was schizophrenic. Paranoid schizophrenia. Obsessive compulsive disorder. And anorexia. All of it. And he was afraid to bring her to the meeting because she might obsess with something and make her worse. So he stood up right then as an act of obedience. Amen. And he looked, his wife's looking at him. He said, it's not about me, it's about Julie. And, she, and he leaves to go get Julie and brings Julie to the meeting. And he gets there just as we're finishing up. And a friend of mine walked by her and just put his hand like that on her forehead and just said, I bless you in Jesus' name. And Julie went out. Amen. And that night when she got home, to her little two-room apartment. Um, she felt, you know, you hear voices in paranoid schizophrenia, but she thought she heard the voice of God. Amen. And lots of people who are schizophrenic think they hear the voice of God and voice of, and they be, sometimes they think they are Michael or Gabriel or, you know, there's, a, there's grandiose things that often is associated with it. But she was right, it was God. Amen. And the Lord spoke to her and said, Take oil and anoint your head. Well, the only oil she had, oil she had was flaxseed oil, so she got it and she put it all over her head. And then the next thing was take off all your clothes, anoint your whole body. You say, well, why that? Oh, I haven't a clue. God sometimes doesn't make sense. <laughs> and so he, uh, um, she did. And the moment she anointed her whole body, the power of God came on her, knocked her in the floor, and she shook under the power of God all night long. And by morning, she was healed of schizophrenia. And, it, and it, it, it happened, it started in this message when the Lord spoke to her stepfather and said, stand up. All right, so... The very first thing I want to point out is in the self-revelation of God, point number one, the self-revelation of God is that God is a God of healing. He's our healer. In the latter part of chapter 15, verse 26, he says, for I am the Lord who heals you. He's saying, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. One of my seven covenant names is I want you to know me as your healer. Michael Brown, a Messianic Jewish scholar who has a book called Israel's Divine Healer. It's about this thick. It's an amazing book. Uh, but anyway, one of the statements in it, he says, in the Old Testament, healing is a stream. But when we enter the New Testament, that stream becomes a flood or a deluge. It's just like there's so much more when we get into the fullness of Revelation in, uh, in the New Testament. So first of all, God reveals himself. I want you to know who I am. I'm Jehovah Rapha. I'm the God who heals you in the self-revelation of God. Secondly, is that the way that we would be able to recognize when Messiah came is Messiah would because the Spirit of God on him. Would be, would be a healer. We see that in uh, Luke chapter 7, verse uh, 20. Luke chapter 7 and verse 20 through 22, 3. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Now, let's put this in context. John's the one who said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Yes. Why is he doubting? Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? The Lord had told him, The one you see the Spirit come upon and remain, that's the one. He had seen that happen. Here's the one who had all of Israel coming to him. The bold proclaimed, the forerunner. Of the Messiah. But now, by the way, Mike Bickle disagrees with my interpretation of this text, but I think I'm right. 
I don't know how you get around this. Are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? That to me sure seems like he's got some quivering of his position. I'd like to tell you what I think is happening. He didn't expect the dungeon. He wasn't expecting to be thrown in prison. It was one thing to be able to make your declaration when you're popular and everybody is coming to hear you. And it's another thing when you've been rejected and been put in prison, especially when your view of him coming is going to be the, you know, if, if, if his own disciples didn't quite understand even the book of Acts in our year, this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel, looking for a political kingdom, how much more is it probable and likely that John the Baptist didn't understand fully how he was going to be the suffering servant. And because of that, he's caught up in the midst of the rejection. And is, that wasn't what he was expecting. And now he's having to rethink his theology. And look at how Jesus answers it. That's what the point of this is. The way you're going to recognize Messiah is by what I do what Messiah does. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Then he put, I thought he put this next little sentence in there just to encourage John. And blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. He said, tell John, remain true. You'll be blessed. Don't fall away on account of me. How are we to know? Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect somebody else telling you you see these things happening? Why? Because the scripture said that when Messiah come, those things, those very things he just did is predicted, prophesied the Messiah would do. And so the way we recognize Messiah was by what he would do. You know, he still heals the blind. Amen. He still does these things. I remember the first time I saw the blind per- a blind person healed, um, the night before, I went to, I'd gone to with Omar Cabrera to uh, Argentina, and I was in his church, and we were in Cordoba, near, up near Brazil, in the northern part of, of Argentina. And I took with me my CPA, because he's the only one that could speak any Spanish. He took Spanish in college. I needed somebody that could speak a little bit of Spanish. And so he's with me. And I remember, we're getting ready to go to bed. We're sharing this hotel room. And, and so he's getting ready to turn off the lights. And he said, Randy, I really realize how skeptical we Westerners are. He goes, I'm having trouble believing what I saw tonight. And I know if somebody told me that this had happened, I would, I would struggle to believe it. But my problem now is I'm the one who saw it. <laughs> I prayed for a woman tonight who had a white eye. Her Hispanic brown eye was totally white, totally blind, And I prayed, she is deaf in in the left ear and blind in the the left eye. And I prayed and her hearing came. I prayed and I watched as she closed her eyes white and opened it brown with a creative miracle and she was healed. And I realized I'm struggling believing what my own eyes saw. I realized how ingrained I bless you in the name of Jesus. And if that was just changing, then go ahead and get an extra blessing. (laughs) You see, I... (laughs) Skepticism. But the blind are still seeing. The next night, I... Well, this is actually the second blind person I saw. Because a, a month or two before, actually about a month before, I was in Belfast, Ireland. And there was this woman, my friend and I, uh, uh, who was traveling with me, uh, my assistant, were in her, in her home, and her sisters brought us there. Or her daughter, I mean, had brought us there. And it's an older lady, and she uh, has lost, has gone blind where she can't 
uh, sea. Uh, and she has to be led around. And she, she just says, I just want to have my sight so I can read the Bible. I miss being able to read the Bible. I just would like to be able to see so I can read the Bible again. And she had uh, uh, her retinas. Her blindness was due to retina problems from diabetes. Her diabetes has caused her retinas to be destroyed to where that now she's blind. We prayed, and she got her sight and was able to read the Bible again. And so... One month later, um, that's the night after the, my friend had prayed for the blind eye I just told you about. The next night, this woman comes up to me and she, she says, I, my problem, I have really bad problems in my digestive system. I have all types of pain in my intestines and it's very painful. Would you pray for me? We, we prayed and, and she gets healed and she's so excited. But she had also said, I'm also my retinas have been destroyed from my diabetes. And so she was healed of the one thing. She starts to walk away and says, wait, wait, wait. Let's pray for those eyes. She said, no, it's okay. I've been blind quite a while. I, I, I just wanted to get out of that pain. She actually didn't have faith for the blindness. <laughs> I said, and I said, no, no, let's pray for your blind. I just saw that get healed less than a month ago, the very same thing you have. And she says, well, I, this, this is okay. No, it's not okay. I want to pray for you. And finally, I talked her in to let me pray for you. <laughs> her faith wasn't very high. Mine was high because I had seen like... Will talk about today. What, what you've seen, what you see creates faith. And so I'd seen that and I said, let me pray. And we began praying and she didn't feel anything for a while. We kept praying. And then she said, I, I, uh, I, I'm feeling something in my eyes. And there was just one huge bright spotlight was, was actually in this place, this old building. You could look through and see the, through the cinder blocks and see the light. It was like what you'd put equipment in, like a barn. And there's these great big bugs about this long, this wide and this thick, and there were hundreds of them on the ground. So when people were slain in the spirit and those bugs were going all over, I'm telling you, there was no courtesy drops that night. I mean, they were, it was legitimate. <laughs> so anyway, I said, why don't you look up at that light? And she, she said, because she's all black. I mean, she was Hispanic, but it was black scene. And, yeah, I clarified that. I realized that could have been a misconfusion there. And she looked up to the light. She said, I can tell there's a light there. So we kept praying. And she said, not that I can see men like trees walking, but she said, I can see, I see things, but I don't know what they are. It's blurry, but my sight's coming back. We prayed again. And she said, I, I can see it's really blurry, but I can tell it's people, but it, it's kind of like black. I don't have any color yet. I don't know why. And we, we, we prayed again, and she's getting clear, but she still couldn't make anybody out. And I feel like the Lord said, get her husband and bring her and put her husband like three feet in front of her. Pray for her one more time and tell her this time when she opens her eyes, she's going to see. Amen. So I put her husband in front of her about three feet. We prayed one more time. She opened her eyes and she recognizes her husband. Amen. Wow. And she hugs him and she's crying and I'm jumping and twirling, jumping and twirling, <laughs> jumping and twirling. It was, it was so exciting. God still is healing the sick and healing the blind. I already told you about my secretary, administrative assistant who quit because she prayed for this guy down in Guatemala City. That was healed. I took my doctor's wife and he, my doctor and his wife with me to Moscow. And in three nights, she prays for eight blind women. Now, she had never seen a blind person healed, but God used her. And she prayed for eight blind women that got their sight on that trip. One of the pastors who came with us had um, macular degeneration, was losing his sight. God healed him. One of the men came up to him. My overseer, at the time I was still in the vineyard movement, my overseer in the vineyard, I used to be his overseer, and we reversed roles, but anyway, he came to me and he said this. Back in America, you're under my authority, but I'm on your trip. This is your team, and so I realize I'm under your authority. And I gotta ask you a question. I'm praying for this woman over here. She's really old, and she's blind. Well, she's not totally blind, 
but she has to put a paper to her nose to be able to see what's on it. That's how, I don't know, nearsighted, farsighted, I don't know which one. That's how farsighted she is. She's got to get it up to her nose and she can't see anything that far away. And I'm praying for her and I'm using the five-step prayer model of the famous vineyard and uh, use five step prayer model. I'm using the five step prayer model, and I keep getting this thought I'm supposed to spit in her eyes. <laughs> but I know that's in the Bible, and I, I, but I'm, I don't want to get you in trouble because I, you know, I'm on your team. And 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 but what do you think I ought to do? <laughs> I said, Well, here's what I think you ought to do you go back to her and tell her what you told me, and let her decide what you do. And if she says spit, you spit. And if she says don't, don't. Just ask her. Tell her what you thought, told me. So he goes back and he tells her and she says spit. Now he doesn't. <laughs> he, doesn't do, he doesn't do that, but he spits in his hands and rubs the spit on her eyes. And when she opened her eyes, you're right, she could see. Now, just in case you want to know this, there is risk with this. And I know that make, as a pastor, those types of illustrations makes me nervous <laughs> when I was a pastor. I said, oh, please don't say that. Uh, but I want to tell you, there is risk. <laughs> I was in Sao Paulo, and I'm, we have a, several thousand meetings, and I'm praying for this young guy who has a deviated septum. And I'm praying, I'm praying, and, but nothing's happening. And I, I get this thought thumping right on the bridge of the nose. And now, it doesn't take much of a risk to do a little like that. That doesn't hurt. But it's like the Lord said, you know, if you're going to really risk for this, you need to thump him as hard as you can thump. Now, my dad is a professional thumper. I grew up in the home of a professional thumper. And when we went to church, the first warning was, and if you didn't, shape up on that the next one was and I'm like, bam and he was good at it I learned from professional and so I told this guy I said you know I got this thought I don't know if it's God or not it might be it might not be I, I honestly don't know I'm just going to present it to you and you know sometimes when I you know sometimes it's God I said but I think you know I'm, I'm supposed to thump you right there but it's up to you what do you want he said thump me so I thumped him. The guy's tears starts coming down. I mean, I thumped him hard. He's enough to cause tears. And he, I said, well, how is it? He said, it's not any better. I said, well, I told you I wasn't sure. <laughs> now, I don't know if he got healed an hour later or that night or sometime, but as far as I know, he wasn't healed. Now, I, I want you to hear that side too. If you never miss, if you never miss, you say, well, where, where, where was the risk? And, and most of us don't start out hearing so perfectly that we hear it right every time. But I still think the Lord in heaven smiled. He said, he thought that was me. The father says to the son, he thought that was me. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> I'm going to keep him around. <laughs> if he thinks it's me, he'll go for it. I like that in him. <laughs> you can't lose by trying to obey because God looks at the heart to see that you want to have a heart of obedience. So, number three, our third point for Pastor Glenn. <laughs> or the second half of the second point, I should say. <laughs> Just to drive this home, the indication of the Messiah would be these things that he would do. And if we look over to chapter 4, of verse 8, 18. This is Jesus in his hometown in Nazareth. And it says in verse 8, or I like to go up to 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, I like this part. He found the place where it's written. Yes. He's looking for the place yes. that it's written. He finds the place where it's written. Yes. And then he reads it. Yes. The spirit of the Lord is on me 
because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Many of you have probably heard sermons on this, but he stops in the middle of the verse. Because if he had gone any farther, he had to talk about judgment. That's when he comes again. But in his first coming, he came not to bring the judgment, but the good news. Proclaim the year that's acceptable to the Lord. Number three, third point. You all have a commission from Jesus to heal the sick. You are all under a commission from Jesus to heal the sick. I'm going to show you where that's at. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. And, and in verse 7, 7 and 8. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Several years ago, my, one of my, when Wimber died, I took, asked two men to become my spiritual fathers. One was Assembly of God pastor, Cleddy Keith, and, uh, near Cincinnati, Ohio, but in, in Kentucky, Florence, Kentucky. And the other was Jack Taylor, a spirit-filled Southern Baptist. And they were like my two spiritual fathers. And I was preaching a meeting in Cleddy's church. And, the, and it was actually this sermon. I'm, I'm preparing to, to give this sermon. And I'm looking through all the scriptures I'm going to use. And this, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this one. And the, and the Lord says, not an audible voice, but an impression. You don't like that verse, do you? This was 1994. We haven't had the big breakthrough that came in 95 yet. And, um, and I only knew of one, two, two stories in all of my life, I've only heard two stories of people being raised from the dead. And I said, no, Lord, you're right. I don't like this sermon. I don't like this scripture. Lord, this scripture is an embarrassment to the church. I didn't know about, there was, Heidi Baker hadn't, I hadn't heard about her yet, you know, hadn't heard about what God was doing. So all I knew of two dead raising stories. I said, Lord, you're telling us to raise the dead when we're trying to get the sick healed. I mean, we fall so short of that commandment that it is an embarrassment. And I felt like the Lord said, you know, well, first let me say this. Do you know how sometimes Pentecostals and Charismatics are accused of being experience-based preaching? Experience-based preachers instead of word preachers? That is an accusation that others, I, I think they don't understand it because I think Pentecostals are very committed to the word of God. And, and if you go back and study the history, uh, you know, it's like keep it scriptural, you know. Uh, it's a very, very strong commitment to the Word of God. As a matter of fact, I think it's a stronger commitment because we take all of the Word yes. for a day and we don't say, well, that's not applying to the day. But, the, but here's the point. The accusations is you guys that open to the Spirit, you're experience-based preachers rather than word-based preachers. Here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. I said, Lord, no, I don't like this verse I wish you'd left that out, especially raise the dead stuff. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clear. It was a rebuke. Don't you dare. It was that. Don't you dare become an experience-based preacher who will only preach what you have experienced. Don't lower my word to the level of your experience, that you'll only preach what you've experienced. Don't lower my word to the level of your experience. Preach my word, all of it. Let your experience rise to my word, but don't bring through a theology of lack, don't bring my word down to the level of your experience. I said, well, okay. And I felt like the Lord said, when you get to the part about raising the dead, you know two stories, you tell them. So when I got to that point, I told the two stories that I knew that Omar Cabrera had, had told me, had prayed for a, the, hit a car, hit a boulder, went off into a deep lake, went in underground, underwater. Uh, he gets out. He dives back in to get his wife out. The other pastor in the back seat with his wife, they both dived down uh, to get her. They had trouble getting her out. And by the time they got her out, she had drowned and she was dead. 
And Omar said, I didn't learn about raising the dead in school. I learned about it in life. And this is my dear friend. And we prayed that God would raise her from the dead. And she came back to life. And we took her to the hospital because she has been, you know, wasn't breathing for several minutes. And, and uh, there was no brain damage or anything. And, and, and then he raised his son uh, uh, from the dead and, and, and he told me you know how he spoke to the, the name of the woman and called her back and everything so that day I preached this sermon and I, and I told that story just a few months later the electric guitar player of the, of the worship team is walking through a small house in Indiana and he sees there's a bunch of cars out through the picture window in the driveway and he looks around, he doesn't see his little boy. And he said, I, 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 I walked out and I, there I saw the tricycle all bent. And then I saw on the street was my little boy. He had just graduated for e, from EMT school, emergency medical technician. And he had been trained to know what the signs of death were. And he said, my son had all of the signs of death. There's no pulse Clammy, eyes were set, and I knew he was dead. And my wife had had a dream that night before that somebody had died in the family, but we thought it was going to be one of the older persons in our family. She went through the neighborhood. She was just screaming, screaming, her little baby boy. Less than five years old, was dead. And then... We'd, had, we'd called 911. Somebody had already called them. But then I remembered this teaching you gave. And I remembered you talked about the dead being raised. That God was still raising the dead. And I began to call on the name of my son yes. to come back into his body. And after a few minutes, I heard him gasp. Breath came into him. And he, he, had, to be, he had to be medevaced in a hot helicopter to another hospital because it, he had so many bones broken all on his ribs and his hip and, and, and his femurs and stuff. It's really, really bad. But he's alive. And they put him in a body cask, cast. And uh, a few weeks into it, uh, he, the mother asked the doctor, can you cut that body cast down? Like even an inch would be more comfortable for him. It's so uncomfortable. And the doctor says, ma'am, he's going to have to wear that for a long time. His brakes are so bad. All we're doing today is checking to see if his bones are starting to begin to mend together. We cannot cut even an inch down. And a few, a short time later, that doctor came out to the mom and dad. Yeah, I don't know how to explain this. But we're cutting that body cast off of him. Woo! That his bones are totally healed. And it, 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 they should have just been beginning to heal. My theory is when resurrection power raises you from the dead, it's really beneficial to your body. One of the women, one of our partners, she uh, had heard this teaching one time. Her, her grandson is at a picnic, and her grandson is out, grandson is out on a jet ski and, and literally is, is hurt in this accident. Hits, and he's got a big gapping uh, uh, cut, really long cut in his thigh. And, um, but he was killed instantly. And because he was killed instantly, his heart is not pumping blood through and they, they ran out in the boat. It took them a while to get there to where he was at. Got him on the boat, brought him back. Their family doctor was at the picnic. He comes, pronounces him dead. But she remembered this teaching. Amen. So grandma gets right next to the body, calling out for her son, calling him by name yeah. to come back into his body. But it's, nothing's happening. And after a while, she's really getting desperate and of course you know, start out desperate but getting more desperate and so finally she's calling to say his name is John I forgot what his name was Johnny this is your grandma I command you to come back in Jesus name and bam his eyes opened up he just graduated from college a couple of years ago and was raised 
from the dead. You'd be surprised if you'll just start talking about people being raised from the dead, how many times you're going to get somebody to tell you the story because they've been a, they didn't think anybody would believe them. So they didn't talk about it. We're not going to lower the word to our experience, but we're going to let our experience rise to the word. Now, in this same passage about when we, this is the commission, but you say, but, but that's the 12. We're not the 12. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to show you how strong this is in Mark chapter 6, um, verse 7 and 12. Calling the 12 to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. In verse 12, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. I mean, this is at the top of the list of what we're supposed to do. Discipleship that doesn't include this is falling short of New Testament discipleship. But you say, but, but still, Randy, this is not, you're, you, that's the 12. We're not the 12. But I believe, if you look over in Luke chapter 10, he also says the same thing to the 70 and the 72 who were not the 12. And we are to understand this Mark, Matthew 10, Mark 7, and Luke 10 that's how we are to interpret and understand because these are paradigmatic. They are the paradigm for which we're to understand. They are the, 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 the lens through which we are to get a clearer picture of how to understand the great commission of Matthew uh, 28, 19 through 20. So when we go to Matthew 28, because I, I, I told you the third point was that every one of you have been commissioned by Jesus to heal the sick. It's, you know, some people are afraid we're going to have, we have an over-realized eschatology. That's an accusation uh, by some in the church. What does that mean? It means that you're expecting God to do now what's reserved for the millennium. But one of the problems in the church is that too much of the church is either got, well, that's what God used to do. God doesn't do it anymore. The sign gifts. Or those things are not going to happen again until Jesus comes back and establishes the millennium. We either put God's activity in the past or in the future, which means we don't expect it in the present. But he didn't say, I am the I was. He didn't say, I am the will be. He said, I am the I am. <laughs> He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. How can we say that the presence of Jesus is in our midst and not have an expectation for good things to happen such as healing and deliverance because if you study his life in the scriptures, it seems like he's going to heal somebody, coming back from healing somebody, talking about it. It's a huge part of who he was. It's part of the demonstration of the kingdom. Healing is not a sign that you're an apostle. Miracles are not given as a sign to prove that you have apostolic ministry. Healing and miracles are to back up the gospel itself. Amen. Mark 16 talks about it, that these signs will confirm not them, it. What? The gospel. As a matter of fact, healing and deliverance, they are not just signs to prove the gospel. They are part of the gospel. The fullness of the full gospel doesn't mean we just start speaking in tongues. <laughs> I'm four tongues. I've spoken in tongues since I was 19 years old. I'm not against it. But that's not the fullness of the gospel. It's that we see the power of God to deliver the demonized, heal the sick, set the captives free. Okay, Holy Spirit. <laughs> my former intern, when I did my doctorate, helped me with my footnotes. Brilliant young woman from Germany named Marion. Marion goes to Rikers, I believe every week. Marion said, Randy, you will not believe how many men who are there should not be there. And if the only thing was if they were a different color they would not be there and there's such an injustice 
in our court system. There's something wrong when people are making money from having stock and systems that build penitentiaries. There's something wrong when it costs more to send a man to penitentiary than it does to send him to Harvard. There's something wrong when some people are heir only because they don't have the money to get him a good attorney. There's something wrong with the system. She's trying to bring justice and bring recognition to something that's wrong so that the oppressed and the captives could be set free. It's not, was never meant to be personal gospel versus social gospel. Up until the modernist fundamentalist controversy in the 1920s, when the liberals and fundamentalists had this terrible falling out, the gospel was always seen to be both personal and social. And all of our major revivals had an impact upon society. But after that break, we were able then to experience revival that didn't necessarily have an impact upon our social structures. Now, having said that, I would like to just quote one other guy. There's a trilogy that deals on the, the powers. I can't think of the exact title, but deals with the powers. And uh, this, the guy who wrote it was basically saying that not... He was saying that a lot of the evil that the enemy uses that makes it so much worse is when he gets involved in the philosophies or the political systems... to bring about great tragedy, wars, I, like Nazism, communism. You know, Stalin starved to death 50 million of his own people. There are these, when, when evil gets into the structures and affects the minds and thoughts and ideology of people, in the name of those ideologies, we'll do terrible things to each other. Now, the weakness of this book is that he doesn't have enough emphasis upon there's not only the evil that gets involved in principalities and powers in structural, structural evil, sociological evil. There's also real demons that can affect individuals. Again, we should not have an either or. It is a both and. And God and the gospel wants to break through these things. That's why this philosophies of demons are so destructive because it, in, it in, entrenches and empowers political systems to do terrible things. Yes, there's been a lot, there's been actually millions of people that died in religious wars, but it pales in comparison with the millions and the scores of millions that were killed in wars that were not religious based. But ideological wars, it was based upon the philosophy of demons. That's faithful. All right. So in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we're going back at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. And that means people groups. Doesn't mean that once we have hit every political nation... Jesus can come back. By the way, I do not believe Jesus coming back is dependent upon the third temple being built. My eye isn't upon Jerusalem and the temple being built. My eye is upon the people groups of the world. And when the people groups of the world hear the gospel of the kingdom, which is more than just the gospel of forgiveness. It's the gospel of the kingdom. When every people group has seen and heard the gospel of the kingdom preached, Jesus Christ is coming back after that's accomplished and not until. That's what he said in Matthew chapter 24. 
It's also interesting to note that in Matthew chapter 24, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days will be the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. It didn't say immediately before. It says immediately after. (laughs) That rabbit just bit the dust. Because I could have chased it. But I didn't. I, I reason. Now, look at what this says. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not a period, it's a comma. Verse 20, and teaching them. Who? The people who come to Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you is more than the moral, live by the golden rule, more than the uh, treat others the way you would want to be treated. it's, it's, It's more than just being a loving person. It's more than just ethical demands. It's more than the ethical side. A lot of preaching is just making better citizens for the country, but there's, but the obedience includes what was at the top of the list in Matthew uh, chapter 10 and in Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 10 of the, to the 70 and 72. At the top of the list, heal the sick and cast out demons and minister to the poor and set the captives free. That's part of discipleship. That's not all, but it's a huge part. What would it do? What would it be like if all Christians in every church was trained and had faith to pray for the sick? Cast out demons, heal the brokenhearted, and compassion for the poor. We can make a bigger difference than we're making. So that was, I can't see that. Okay. Um, Number, what would this be? Four? Thank you. Because I don't have them listed that way. I've got in in mind, it's, it's the seventh scripture, but it's the fourth point. Fourth point. What's the scope of healing? You know what I mean by scope? What can we expect God to heal? How much can we expect God to heal? Would you turn with me to Psalms 103, verse 2 and 3? First of all, what I'm reading from is poetry. It's Hebrew poetry. That's why it's written in a poetic verse. And I used to think that means it's all just symbolic. And that's when I saw that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. fire. Wow, my southern accent came out. Far. Fire. Uh, that it, he, I, used, I just took it as symbolic language until I realized, no, they actually do manifest sometimes as winds, literally, and fire. Um, but... So this is Hebrew poetry, and it's called Hebrew parallelism. What does that mean? In the first, it's kind of like the uh, what's um, annotated Bible. Is that what I'm looking for? The annotated Bible, amplified. amplified that's what I'm looking for. The amplified Bible. You know, it, it, it's like you read it, and it's got, it explains a little more. But in Hebrew parallelism, it, it, it's like the first part says something, and then the second part explains it and develops it even more. Now, why don't you look at this in verse 2 and 3. The first stanza is verse 2. Praise the Lord. Now, he's speaking to his soul. And this is, this is a command. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, the next verse explains what those benefits are for which we're to praise the Lord. So here are the benefits that we're to praise the Lord for. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. So how, what should be the scope? What should we expect God to heal? Now, to be truthful, most of us have our own scope. And it's usually related to what we've seen happen. Now, we know it's possible, you know, theoretically possible. God could heal everything. But if we've never seen certain things healed, we really don't have what I would call a living faith or expectation to see that happen. 
That's why, but when you, once you see it happen, it, it begins to shift things, and we need to see more. And I just want to share some of the things that, that I've seen that deals with diversity of conditions. I've already talked about the schizophrenia, both of them. One of the women, the mother repented, and then her daughter was set free, and then the, the other guy stood up and went and got the daughter, and she was healed. So schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, I want to start with that because that was, that was my Goliath. Remember what Goliath did? He taunted the armies of Israel, or the army of Israel. I felt like schizophrenia was the Goliath that was taunting me. Um, in my church in St. Louis, we developed the first support group for people who had mental illness. And as it grew, I felt like after a while we were going to get outnumbered because we were the only support group in a church in the city of St. Louis for mentally ill. It was led by a man who had, who had bipolar disorder and had lost his first marriage. Uh, he stripped off naked and ran down the streets. He went to Oral Roberts University, stood up and called Oral Robert a false prophet and had to be carried out. He had done terrible things in the midst of a delusional episode of, of bipolar. And it cost him his marriage. Um, it destroyed his life. And uh, I met him when I was just starting the church. And I took him up to my to my bedroom, we sat on the bed together because there's some other people downstairs talking and, and it was one of the early, just we didn't even have 20 people in the church. We sat on the bed and I just began to pray for him. And he said, I've never been prayed for that way. You know, I was, I was quiet and I was just blessing his head and stuff. Anyway, um, no, even on medication, he was hospitalized every year for two weeks with an episode even on medication. That was 1986. He's never been hospitalized since. Even after remarried and having his first baby and his wife was well blessed in, in bosom area. Uh, very well blessed. <laughs> And, he and then they discovered that she had breast cancer and was going to have a breast removed. And he has a new baby. With the, with the news that his wife is going to have her breast removed and having a new baby, he, be he checked himself into the hospital, fearful that it might put him over the edge. But it didn't. And he wasn't there, but... I believe one night, and he went back and said, I don't need this, and they let him out. It, it, that was just precautionary. Even in the worst of things that definitely would have put him over the edge before, it didn't. He became the leader of this group, mental illness. And, and there was a man, 26 years old, developed schizophrenia in the Air Force, and uh, I, I said, I'll pray for you every time I see you. And I meant it. If I saw him up somewhere in a store, I'd walk over to him and pray for him because I was traveling a lot. But anytime I saw him, I would pray for his healing. We had a covenant every time I see you. We're going to come against this. We're going to pray for your healing. And then I found out while I was on a trip on time that he had accidentally, it was an accident, it was not suicide, but he accidentally overdosed on his medication and died. And I felt like this is the Goliath. I have never seen anybody of schizophrenia healed. And I'd prayed for several. And one day I was with Omar Cabrera Jr. And he said, Randy, ask the woman across this table from you her story. She's in her 40s. Somewhere in her 40s. And I said, well, she could speak English. I said, what's your story? She said, when I hit 40, and they're from a very wealthy family that owned factories and they drove their Mercedes Benzes and they a very wealthy family. I was hit with schizophrenia. And the schizophrenia was so bad that I couldn't be trusted. I would try to drink Tide or motor oil. I was literally so mentally ill, of course we'd call it just insane. Hearing voices and just terrible. And she was a, a nominal Catholic that did not attend, was a non-practicing Catholic. 
and a, a Pentecostal friend of hers got her to go to one of Omar Cabrera's meetings. And she said, l- l- let's say that this is open area here would be the opening into the church. And the church is in there, and they're worshiping. And she says, I'm on the arm of my friend. They couldn't even let go of me. I'm just wander off. You know, I was just... And we're walking together. And I am mentally ill. I am insane. But the, when I crossed over that threshold, right. I was oh. instantly, totally healed of schizophrenia. No one prayed for her. No one touched her. She said, all I did was I crossed over that threshold. Bam. And I'll, okay, okay, I, I know of a story. And then I heard of a person that took a little longer, lots, she'd been raped repeatedly and it, and it caused her to dissociate and stuff. And, and uh, it took longer because they, people are faithfully ministering to her. It's a totally different story, but she had been healed. I knew those stories, but I'd never seen it happen. And I felt like this is my Goliath. Not only that, we were seeing a lot of physical healing, but very little mental illness being healed. And you know what I did? I took this. And I put my finger right here. And I took my associate pastor and my assistant pastor. And I said, the last day we're together before Sunday, I said, we're going to walk through this church and we're going to put our hands on every seat. And we're praying, God, your word says you heal all our diseases. It does not say you heal our physical illness, but don't heal our mental illness. It says you heal all our diseases, God. Our experience, we're not seeing that yet, but your word says. And so we're reminding you of your word, Lord. We believe you can do it, and we're asking for it, and we're believing it's going to happen. And it was several weeks of that when we began to see mental illness start to be healed. I told Bill Johnson that story. That's what they did. It wasn't very long that they began to see. Now, I know there's been well over 80 people with bipolar that was, was healed. And most of them were healed just through the testimony Amen. or through worship. But they had not seen it happen until there was a crying out and a believing. This too. See, our scope of healing shouldn't be defined by what our experience is. Amen. But by what the word says. I was in Bergen, Norway, in, on the west coast of Norway. And I have two, three seminarians that are Methodist or Lutheran. I think it was Methodist. And they've been taught liberal theology. Uh, they don't believe demons are real. That's Jesus condescending to the first century worldview. And if he came in the 21st century, he would have given a psychological analysis of what was really going on there. That's, that's, that's liberalism. And uh, I came up to this man, and, and uh, he was uh, disabled. He's in his 40s, been disabled for 23 years. Total disability. Because he never knows when it's going to happen. He'll just get these jabbing pains through his lungs. That, and the doctors can't figure out what it is. So I went up to him, assuming it's a physiological problem. I don't start out with thinking it's a spirit. That's my, def- that's my default is there's a natural cause. And then... If there's reason to think it's not that, then we'll switch. But I'm thinking it's just... So I start to pray for his lungs. And, I, and when I said, in, I bless your lungs in the name of Jesus. And when I said in the name of Jesus, he went, ah! and it hit him right then. Now, I have this thing. You spot them, you got them. You spot them, you got them. And if you... I didn't know this when I, before. When I first started praying for the sick, I'd go into somebody's hospital room and I'd start praying. I'd say, how are you doing? I said, oh, I got worse. When the moment you started praying, I got worse. My pain got worse. I said, man, I knew I wasn't anointed. I, I prayed to get worse. <laughs> Only later did I realize that you were winning the battle. Yeah. But you didn't understand. You didn't understand the ways of God. You didn't know that the reason why they were getting worse was that... Oh, gosh. That, <laughs> you know what I'm thinking about, don't you? That spirit trying to hang on. I was trying to illustrate this the other day in Brazil. And I got this guy, my translator, he's kind of a big guy. And I, and, and, and I come here, William, I'm not going to do the whole thing. But, and so, you know, I said, I'm, I'm the spirit. And you say, come out in Jesus' name. And I go, come out in Jesus' name. Come out in Jesus' name. And then come out in Jesus' name. And then I just jumped on his back. Well, he wasn't as strong as William. And we both fell backwards. You know, just to wham. We, I, I'm not going to do that for again. But anyway, it was trying to illustrate 
he's trying to hang on. The fact that it's getting worse or moves is an indication you're, you're dealing with a spirit. Now, it's not a natural cause. And, and so the moment I saw that, I knew what it was. And I looked at those liberal seminarians. I said, watch this. And I said, in the, I changed my prayer. I, didn't, I wasn't blessing his lungs anymore. I said, in the authority of Jesus' name, I command that spirit to come out of you. I break your power and cancel your assignment in Jesus' name. And he was instantly delivered. I saw his pastor. He came to Philadelphia. We did a 30-day meeting years ago. His pastor came. It had been five years after that. He said, that man is totally off disability and has never had a pain since five years. And so sometimes it's caused by a spirit. So it includes that. I was in the first week in Toronto. I prayed for a little girl, 14 years old, and I was praying blessing. I wasn't even praying for healing, just praying blessing. And she, and, uh, uh, she had already fallen out once and she came and her family, a bunch of them from Tennessee, uh, um, and, and they wanted prayer. And I said, well, I, wait till I prayed for everybody once before we start on seconds. And so about one o'clock in the morning, they came up to me again. And, I, I, and so I started praying for them. And she went out. But this time she wasn't out for like five minutes and then got up. She's out for 45. Now they're going to drive home in the middle of a blizzard. It's really snowing bad outside. And they got a 14-hour drive. You have to be hungry to hang around for your seconds. You got a 14-hour drive in a snowstorm. But she's out 45 minutes, and when she got up, she said this. I, I, I didn't even know she had anything wrong with her. She said, Mom, I had a vision while I was out. I was like in an operating room, and I saw an angel come. And when the angel came, he opened up my head and he rewired my brain. She was a severe dyslexic. She was in the eighth grade reading at the second grade level and couldn't do math at all because couldn't keep the numbers in line. Humiliated as her little sister just passed her up so fast. You know, Heidi Baker was dyslexic was a child. She has a PhD and was a speed reader later after God healed her, but she still has struggles with a self-image of being dumb from that experience of dyslexia. She said, Mom, bring me a book. And Mom brought her a book, and she opened up the book, and she began to read it fluently Amen. for the first time in her life. Amen. Five years later, she graduated number five in her high school class went on and graduated with honors from college. But at 14 years old, when she got home, her best friend, who was not up there, the associate pastor's daughter, Monica Morgan Donor, also was dyslexic. Heather Harvey, her name at the time, she didn't tell Monica what she had seen, but what she did was this. She walked up to her best friend and said, Monica, Jesus is going to heal you. Amen. Touched her, and Monica went, and Monica got up and said, I had a vision. I saw an angel come. And that angel rewired my head. And Monica was likewise healed of dyslexia. Now, I'm telling you what I've seen. But I also need to tell you one other thing. My third son had such a severe learning disability, my third child, my second son, that in, when he went, entered high school, I was called in by the psychologist and the counselor, and he said, to expect your child to graduate from high school would be like expecting someone to run a marathon who doesn't have legs. He tested in the bottom 3% of the American population. He has a severe learning disability. Disability. Part of it was like dyslexia, but part of it was more than that. I remember as a little boy, he'd come home from grade school and because he'd know something at night but couldn't remember it in the morning. And he'd slap his head and said, I hate my brain, I hate my brain, I hate my brain. And I remember the night he called me aside in junior high. No, it wasn't quite in junior high yet, like fourth, fifth grade. And he said, Dad, why did God heal those two girls? When you, you healed 
Heather when you prayed for her and Monica was healing it. But I'm your son and he's not healed me and you've prayed for me hundreds of times. I'm just being real with you. And I said, son, I don't know. I can't answer that. But what I can say is when I look to the cross, I can't doubt God's love for us. I don't understand. I don't know how to answer it. But I believe that God can heal you. And we're going to keep praying. I believe that you can be healed. The timing I don't know about. But we're not going to give up. His senior year, I go in for parent, teacher, and I meet with them again. And they said, Mr. Clark, we can't explain this. And we don't know what's happened. But your son tested normal. Well, we don't know how. I'm glad we didn't give up. I'm glad we didn't lower the scope according to our experience. But we let the word broaden our experience. Greensboro, North Carolina, a brothers, two brothers came up. Both severe ADHD. Prayed for them. The next day they went to school. And they came home with a note from the teacher. What happened to your kids? I understand this because I remember my own son. I was telling you about it. Every day around 3 o'clock he got put in detention. Because he had been in school as long as his body and mind would let him. And he, and, he, and he wasn't trying to be rebellious. It was just like his condition was, you know, he, he couldn't handle anymore. And by that three o'clock hour, he's just burned out. I understand. I've lived through it. Calling, you know, it's like every day, you need to come down. And the, the note said, what happened to your boys? They're so well-behaved. They were well behaved because they didn't have ADHD anymore. God had healed it. It's like in Knoxville, Tennessee, praying for an RN who had diabetes with injections. And we prayed and said, now don't throw your insulin away, but check it. And as if, it, you know, if your insulin markers say reduce it, reduce it. I don't believe it's faith by not taking medicine. A lot of people in the healing ministry, a lot of problems came to the healing, uh, healing ministry because of a theology. If you have faith, you'll not take your medicine. A lot of people reject the healing ministry because people have died because they wouldn't take treatment. That's seen as a thing of faith. In New England, a lot of kids died on a boat, got in trouble because they wouldn't give them medicine. CMA, in the early years of the CMA, they wouldn't take quinine on the mission field. And lots of young men and women died because they wouldn't take medicine. Because they, it was like if you have medicine, you're not, if you, 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 you can't have faith if you take medicine. I don't go there. I believe if you're healed, you'll not need that medicine. And so I told her, I said, you check it, adjust it. And over three days, she kept coming down in her insulin amounts because God was bringing healing. And after three days, she was absolutely, totally off insulin. I said, good, get me a, a letter from your doctor that you're healed. Her doctor, six years later, still would not give her a letter that said she was healed because the doctor said, it's impossible to be healed of this. I don't know exactly what's happening, but I'm not going to write a letter that says you're healed because our medical science says this is impossible. Uh, six years, not one insulin, not one injection. Nope, I won't. I won't write that. She didn't need it because healing had come. Amen. One of the most powerful healings that I can want to refer to is, um, again, what's the scope of healing? I'm just talking about different kinds of healings because if you've not heard of a certain kind of healing, you need to hear about it. You need to hear, yes, this too is included in the scope of healing. 
I'm at Clady Keith's church, the second largest assemblies of God in the state of Kentucky. This couple comes up. They got a little girl, seven years old. This little girl was adopted as a baby, newborn, from Russia. She's now seven years old. And they brought her to me and they said this, we notice a very unusual, almost bizarre behavior developing in our daughter. We took her to a Christian psychiatrist. They did a battery of tests and it came back that she's borderline sociopath and she may have to be put locked up to protect herself from herself and to protect society from her because a sociopath has no sense of right and wrong. We prayed. A couple of weeks later, they noticed change in behavior and they took her back to the same doctor, did the same battery test, she tested normal. Amen. Nothing is outside the pale of God's healing. In my notes here, September the 3rd, or September 2003, I mean, says Brazil. I remember this meeting. I just made some notes. In this meeting, it was about eight days, we had 10 cancerous tumors disappear. Three people confirmed healed of AIDS. A paraplegic healed, walked out of the wheelchair. 60 deaf and 15 blind were healed. I just want to tell you about the paraplegic. There's this guy, North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina. He's a recovering alcoholic. Three years in a row, his wife's an RN. She had been with me several times. We had about 80 to 100 on the team. And she had been with us, seeing all these healings. She'd come home and told me he wanted to come. But he was a recovering alcoholic. And every year, right before it's time to go, he'd fall off the wagon. And so he'd feel disqualified and wouldn't go. This year, he made it. He maintained his sobriety and he came. But he's never prayed for one person for healing in his life. And he thought, this would be the great place to practice. I'm going to go to Brazil. I've heard so much. It's supposed to be easy there. And so he, 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 he comes to Brazil and it's, a, it's about 11 o'clock at night and I'm introducing the, the no, it's actually like quarter to 12 and, and uh, I'm introducing the ministry team and I'm, I'm inviting people now to come to the front who wants prayer. We've already prayed for words of knowledge and stuff like that. It's just come up, whatever your problem is, the team's going to pray for you. And so he prays as the people start coming. He prays this little prayer. Lord, you know I've never prayed for anybody in my life and this is my first time to pray for anybody. So Lord, I ask that you bring me an easy one like a headache or a bellyache, nothing hard, Lord. You know, start me out easy. Headache, bellyache, nothing hard. <laughs> and he sees this young man. And he says, no, Lord, not that, not that, not that, Lord. Send him somewhere else. He said, I wouldn't even look at him. I turned my head like that. I'm not going to look at him. I don't want him to come to me, go somewhere else. You know, I'm, I've never prayed for anybody in my life. I don't want to start out with somebody in a wheelchair. Got somebody easy, headache, bellyache, not that. And the guy rolled right up to him, pulls on his pants. He said, I had read your material. I knew what I was supposed to do, but I'd never prayed for anybody. So I interviewed him. What's wrong? <laughs> I mean, there could be a lot of reasons why you could be in a wheelchair, really. He said, I'm 25 years old. I'm a police officer. And two months ago, I was in a, a firefight and I got shot and the bullet went through my stomach and severed my spinal cord. And I was told I'll be a paraplegic for the rest of my life. Now that would not be encouraging to hear, you know, almost anything than that, a severed spinal cord. He said, I had oh, so little faith. It's like almost nothing. But I prayed. But now he had missed, there had been a mechanical problem on the airline, so he's been up for 48 straight hours without sleep. Yeah. And it's almost midnight. And he's exhausted and tired. 
He said, I'm praying from behind the guy. I do everything your, your manual said to do. I've interviewed him. I found it's going to be a natural cause. I know it's not a demonic spirit. I know it's not psychosomatic. I know it's not psychologically induced or any way. I know it's a natural cause. And so I'm speaking to the condition. I'm praying for it to be regenerated and put back together. And then the second thing I'm supposed to do is stop and see if anything's happening. I asked him, does he feel anything different? He said, no. Try and move. No, nothing different. He said, my little bit of faith. <laughs> Now I have absolutely none. But I remember that you said, you do not hold us responsible, the members of the team. You don't hold us responsible to heal anybody because you know we can't heal anybody. God's the healer. But you do hold us responsible to minister in a way they, the person, when you walk away, feels valued and loved. He said, I honestly wasn't praying in faith. I had no faith left. I was just praying that he'd feel like he deserved that I valued him enough to stay longer. I felt like if I quit right now, that guy's not going to sense that he's loved or has any value. So I'm just praying for that reason. But as the longer I'm praying, the more tired I'm getting until finally my head now is on his shoulder. And right before I started snoring, the guy jumped out of the wheelchair. turned around and grabbed me and just wept all over my shirt. And I, I wished I could say I celebrated that and it was so mature in the Lord, but I wasn't. I was frustrated. I, I went to bed that night complaining. I, I, was, I, was, I was praying a modern day psalm. You ever notice that David sometimes starts out his psalms complaining? But I like David, I ended up in praise. I started out and said, Lord, that wasn't right. That's not fair. That was his first time to pray for anybody. And I have prayed for so many people in wheelchairs that have not got out of wheelchairs. And that was his first time. And Lord, I heard his testimony. He didn't even have any faith when you did it. So Lord, I, I just, that's not right. And then I realized how immature that prayer was. <laughs> and I said, oh Lord, forgive me. Because I realize that his victory is my victory because we are one body in Christ and it's all about you, it's not about me. And uh, so for the rest of the trip, I would introduce him. This is the man who prayed for a person in a wheelchair with a severed spine that got healed. All of you who are in wheelchairs, come up and let him pray for you. <laughs> uh, so having, oh, I got to hurry here. Having um, looked at the scope of healing, by the way, I forgot to tell you, the introduction, that wasn't meant to be a historical thing. So I want to just say this, declare this, so we'll be on the same page. Everywhere we've gone and preached this sermon, I always told them, it's still for today. It's for right now. And if you feel the power of God begin to touch you. You need to stand up until I see you and I'll tell you, I bless you in Jesus' name and you can be seated at the end of the service. We'll see how many got healed. Amen. I don't know if you got that or not. So I wanted you to know that is, we're, we're, we're going for it again. Amen. I don't think this will be the first time nobody stood up. So what's the basis of healing? This is the heart of the message. That's why I want to make sure because this is the most important part. Everything else I said, this is more foundational than anything. What's the basis of healing? Because if you don't understand the basis of healing, your prayers will be pathetic instead of prophetic. <laughs> your prayers will be based upon nothing in Scripture that gives you a, 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 a foundation upon which to have faith. And so I want to get this. There are three bases of healing the covenant, the atonement, and those two are related, and the kingdom. Turn to Exodus chapter 34, verse 10. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders, never before done in any nation in all the world. So, This word is, I'm making a covenant with you. And one of the aspects of that covenant is, I'm going to do wonders in you. Now, wonders is more than healing. It's other types of miracles too. But it includes healing. 
Healing may not be inclusive of wonders, but wonders is inclusive of healing. Amen. It's one of the things that he was going to do. It's in the covenant. The book of Hebrews says that we have a new covenant. And this new covenant, it's a better covenant based with better promises based upon a better sacrifice. If healing wonders is in the old covenant, how much more is it in the new covenant? As Michael Brown said, healing is a, tr a stream in the old covenant, but it becomes a flood in the new covenant. Jesus said in these, if you believe in me, the things that I do, these two shall you do, and even greater things than these shall you do because I'm going to the Father. He's talking about in that context because he's going to the Father, then he's going to send the Spirit. And there's going to be a multiplication. I know people who have raised more people from the dead than Jesus did. He's, he's, oh, don't, don't say that. Oh, blasphemy. No, Jesus, it's honoring what Jesus said. Jesus said, you'll do more than I have done. Why? Because he, his ministry is only three years long. He only got to minister for three years and they crucified him. Some people get to minister for 60 years. One of my spiritual fathers has been ministering for 60 some odd years. 68 years. That's a long time. It honors Jesus when he, what happens, what he said would happen, actually happens. It doesn't take away. The greatest miracle, I believe, and the greatest reward for his death at the cross is the power of the Spirit to come upon his people that we could hear, that we could see, and he would do what he has done because every healing that happens through a Christian is a healing Jesus did. Because he and the Father is in that Christian by the Holy Spirit continuing. You know, the book of Acts said that which Jesus began to do. His book of Acts is the continuation of what he had started doing in the gospel. He's con it's a continuation of what he's, what he's doing through the church. So we see healing is in the covenant. When I did, in 1995, I told you I went to Melbourne, Florida. That's where I saw more healings there and in uh, Charlotte that month. And I'd seen the first 24 years put together. And, and a lot of them was at the, the church, a charismatic church there. But I read a, a review from the Presbyterian church, a cessationist Presbyterian church. And the pastor was talking about how he wished it could have been in his church but his church actually had so many healings that took place. I don't know how it could stay a cessationist church with so many healings going on. But the amazing thing is the name of the church was New Covenant Presbyterian Church. All right, now let's look at Isaiah 53. This is the great passage on Jesus, the suffering servant, uh, that looks 700 years before Jesus was born, and everybody recognizes that this is so prophetic of Jesus and his ministry and what he would do. And when we look in verse 4, surely he took up our infirmities. The word that's translated took up is a Hebrew verb, and, and carried our sorrows. I used to know what they were, but I didn't look it up to refresh my memory. And carried, cir circle took up, and circle carried. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Now, the word sorrows there is not a very good translation. A better translation is pains. It's really interesting that when you look at Luke chapter 8, verse 17, he says, This was where Jesus healed a bunch of people. This was to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He quotes this passage. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our, and he uses the word diseases. Now, why? Is because when the, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Covenant, that was in existence at, at this time. That's the way it was translated. That Hebrew word was translated diseases. And, he's, he's, and Luke's gospel was written to the Gentile, whereas Matthew's was written to the Jew. And, and so as an audience. And so we see that he, he's talking about, in, in, and yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten of him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression and he was crushed for our iniquities. Verse 5. Then in verse 
the latter part of, uh, of verse 5, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now, just one little peculiar thing. The, the plural there is not in the Hebrew. It's actually a singular. And by his wound we are healed. And why? Because that scourging from the top of his shoulders to the top bottom of his heels that ripped his flesh apart with little pieces of bone and metals, when that whip would land in his flesh and he'd pull it back, it jerked pieces of flesh out. It, would, it became one huge wound, if you were to look at it. And by his wound, we are healed. Now, down in verse 11, in the latter sentence of verse 11... And he will bear their iniquities. And the last sentence of, the, of Isaiah 53. And he bore the sin of many. He will bear their iniquities. And he bore the sin of many. Do you notice that those two words, bear and bore, has nothing as similar to took up and carried in English? But in Hebrew, they're the exact two words. The same words that deals with infirmities and pains are exactly the same two Hebrew verbs that deals with bare iniquities and bore the sin. What's the basis of our healing? The cross. What happened at the cross opened up the stream into a flood. The more we have an understanding of how important this is. You know, he could have been crucified without that scourging. A lot of men, they, why, why they quit at 39 lashes was men died at 40. But there is purpose in God. It shows how important I don't believe he suffered in vain or for no purpose or reason. Uh, yes, he shed his blood at the cross. He died at the cross for our forgiveness. But the scourging and the bearing in his body, our sickness and our diseases had a purpose. Now, lastly, in this three reasons uh, Jesus, the, the, the basis of healing. So when I pray, I remind God of his covenant. I remind God of what Jesus did at the cross. When Melanchthon was dying and was already in a coma, Martin Luther, Lutherans don't believe it, they, they don't believe in the sign, they don't believe the sign gifts continued. But Martin Luther reminded God of these promises. He said, I quoted every promise of Scripture. And he said, if I can't trust you in this, what can I trust you in? And if, you'd, if you would read the actual prayer that's recorded that uh, Luther prayed for Melanchthon, who was the, more or less the formalized the theology of Lutheranism, you would think Luther had graduated from Ramah. I know that historically, you know what I'm trying to say by that? Because he did. Another time he found out that, I, uh, I, was, I forgot the guy's name uh, right at this moment, but another one of the reformers was dying. And Luther wrote to him. And Luther wrote and said, I forbid you to die. You will not die. You're going to live and you're going to outlive me because I have need of you and this is my will and I know my will is lined up with God's will. You will not die. And the guy came back from being close to death. And he lived uh, either one or two months longer than Luther did. <laughs> I bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. <laughs> I'm getting a little nervous there. Now, we said also healing had three bases. Oh, and by the way, this passage, by his wounds, we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 says, and by his Wounds, we were healed. Luke chapter 10, verse 9, is another, the third basis for healing. Healing is in the covenant. Healing is in the cross. And the cross really points to the covenant. But healing is also in the kingdom. Luke 10, 
In verse 9. Heal the sick who are there. This is the commission to the 70 or the 72. And tell them the kingdom of God is near you. You know, Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you know the kingdom of God has come to you. The finger of God meant the, the power of God, the spirit of God. But he also connected healing to a demonstration that the kingdom is near you. It, it, the healing is in the kingdom. So when we preach the message that Jesus preached that John the Baptist said he would preach, that Paul preached, that Stephen preached, that Philip, I bless you in the name of Jesus, that Philip preached. It was the message, the gospel of the kingdom. In the kingdom is healing. It's, it's a now. It's not over-realized eschatology. It's not believing. They're saying, no, everybody, uh, the, the healing will come when Jesus comes back. Everybody that's sick is going to be healed. But healing is not reserved for the millennial reign of Jesus. It's still part of the good news. It's part of the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Every one of you preachers, are you peddling term insurance? <laughs> or are you preaching whole life? And you all know, whole life costs a lot more. But it's already been paid. It's already, the premium's been paid for whole life. What's the difference between, I bless you in Jesus' name. What's the difference between term insurance, for you who may not know this, term insurance and whole life, I bless you in Jesus' name. I think he likes this point. I bless you in Jesus' name. What's the difference between term insurance and whole life? So to benefit from term insurance, what do you have to do? Die. You got to die. There's no benefit until you die. So much of our gospel is pie in the sky in the sweet by and by that Karl Marx said as he listened to the gospel being preached in England of cessationism. He said it, 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 it's, it's the opiate of the people. It, it satisfies the people for a better life after this life. Because he didn't see in the gospel of his day, they didn't see signs and wonders. They didn't see miracles. They didn't see an emphasis upon God's concern for people in the present. And that's why they got such a, a bad view. And he came up with an alternative to it in communism. Anyway, whole life, you can enjoy it while you're still alive. You can benefit it from it in the present. I bless you in the name of Jesus. He's the one that made the price. I bless you in the name of Jesus. And I want to challenge every pastor here to examine your gospel, to see if the emphasis is one upon what you get when you die or is there an emphasis in your gospel, the kingdom that is now available to us. And I do not believe that I am guilty of overrealized eschatology. I believe my uh, uh, detractors are guilty of an underrealized eschatology. They're not expecting enough. They're not expecting what the Bible says uh, can be ours. So, let's just stay on this subject a little bit. I, I, you know, Pastor, can you tell me what point I'm on? <laughs> you lost count. This is this is point number five. Point number five. I'm going to have to redo this with points. Uh, <laughs> the basis of healing was a point. That was number five. Okay, the bait. And we're on the third sub point of that point. <laughs> healing is in the kingdom. And 5.3, yeah. yeah. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Nor will people say, it's all about, this is about the kingdom of God. The coming of the kingdom of God. That's the kind of the subject of this passage of scripture. Verse 21. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Yes. Now, I got to tell you something. I got I to let you know, that verse really bothered me. And when I first started preaching this sermon, this is what I said. I watered it down. I actually did. 
I thought that's too dangerous a verse. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. The, the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is in you, so the kingdom of God is in you. Healing's in the kingdom. Healing's in the kingdom. The kingdom's in you. You're loaded. But when I first started in 1995 preaching this, I, then I would say, but you ain't the king. But that's not the concern. The concern is you get the idea that the kingdom's in you. Now, I mean, just if you want to look something up, I don't have time to go there, but look up Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 through 27, and it kind of helps you get a better understanding of the kingdom of God in you, which, but um, now, point number six, <laughs> I'd like to, for you to see a model for how to respond when God uses you. See, the enemy will work all night. All, he'll work very, very hard. Let me put it that way. The enemy will work very, very hard to convince you that healing's not for today. That the sign gifts are over. Oh, yes, God may answer the prayers of the church and there might be a miracle. We're not saying miracles are gone. That's what cessations will say. But they're rare. As one of my detractors on the radio, I heard him say, he said, I believe in healing, but healing is not to be normative. Now, what does that mean? Healing is not to be normative. Healing is not to be a normal experience. You know what? If you were taught in a church that teaches healing is not to be normative, it's a self-fulfilling word. That church will not have healing as normative. There will be rare exceptions to the norm. And if you believe it, it becomes true. But healing is meant to be normative. It doesn't mean every person we pray for gets healed. Though there, I believe we can have times and we should believe that there will be times that we can see that even. But it doesn't mean every person we ever pray for in our life is going to be healed. But it does mean healing can be so regular, so happening so frequently. We'd say, well, let me put it this way. I went through, I bless you in Jesus' name. I went through 14 years as a pastor and saw five healings. Healing was not normative. After 1984, healing became normative on a monthly basis. After 1995, when the breakthrough then, healing became normative almost every service. Amen. Until this day, every time we pray for healing, Healing is normative. Somebody gets healed. It's normative. What changed? Sovereignty of God? Nope. What changed? My understanding of the ways of God. My experience of the faithfulness of God. My breakthrough by seeing. And it depended upon others. There were other, I had others ahead of me. Like Omar Cabrera and Wimber and others who got, and, 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 and I read the Pentecostals. I read the faith cure movement. I, there these men and, pioneer, and women, pioneers of faith who opened doors for us. We, and I believe God wants it to be true. What Bill Johnson says, God wants our ceiling to be the floor of the next generation. But having said that, I, what, what can't, what, someone said, I want your anointing. I said, yeah, I'll be glad to give you this. Little, pray for you to get the anointing, but I can't give you my history in God. You have to develop your own history in God. There can be an anointing come upon you, but you have to walk that out and steward it. So we're going to look in Acts chapter 3. We're looking at the uh, how do we respond. What's the proper response to when God uses us? Now, this is important. The enemy will work hard as he can to convince you healing's not for today. When he loses that battle, he's looking for another way that he can shut you down. He's looking for another way that he can limit your success. He's looking for another way that he can hinder what you see. And the Bible, I mean, the devil 
who means deceiver and Satan means accuser, he knows the scripture. And he knows how, he's a legalist. And he knows how to try to deceive you into a position where that you cannot receive the blessing as much because of a coming against the, the character and pr- purposes of God. He knows that the scripture says at least three times, God will oppose the proud and give grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, in the sight of the Lord. In due time, he shall exalt you. The devil knows that verse. And he knows that the the word of God says that God will oppose the proud. Pride can put a ceiling on our experience in God. Humility removes the ceiling. That's why for my life, I have really made it one of the major points in my life to try to remain humble so that I can go farther, not get stopped by pride. That and also I just, since I was a little kid, didn't like pride in people. I just, anyway, can't go there. Shoot that rabbit too. Uh, So anyway, we're in chapter 3. Verse 11, while While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them. This is after he healed the guy at the gate, beautiful. Came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, this is the verse, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? And then he starts telling them about God. And he gets down in verse 16. He gives them why this man can walk. By faith in the name of Jesus This man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you can all see. I remember I was in Guatemala at that same church and so many people are getting healed. I'm, I'm aware. I feel grieved in my spirit that the people are looking to myself and my assistant as if we're the ones doing the healing. And I actually said, let's stop. You guys got your focus on the wrong one. You're looking to me, and you're looking to Mark as if somehow we're doing this. We're not doing this. This is done in Jesus' name. i got to redirect us. Let's go back into worship. Let's focus on Jesus because you're looking at me, and I'm not the healer. Jesus is the healer, and he is, I, I, I believe he's jealous. The Father and the Spirit, the whole, every one of the Trinity is jealous for the other to get the acknowledgement, the glory, the praise, not us. And I think it can grieve the Holy Spirit if we allow that to develop. And what does Peter do? What's the proper response? Reflect it. I call Peter the first Teflon Christian. (laughs) He will not let the glory stick to him. He lets it slide right over to Jesus where it belongs. Now, how does the enemy work against this? Why is this so important? You may have gone through much of your life not seen a lot of healing and you have a breakthrough and God begins to bless you and the enemy will come and sit on your shoulder. I don't believe it's the devil. None of us are probably powerful enough in God that the devil himself will show up. Huh. Just one of his little minions. Sit on your shoulder. And this is what he probably starts saying. Has the pastor recognized you? You got more anointing than he does or she does. You're having more healings than any of the other elders. And you may not even be an elder. Are they recognizing? I think they're jealous of you. I think they're just ignoring you. Why don't they exalt you, lift you up? Why don't they, why aren't they telling people what God's doing through you? You see what he's doing? He's working for division. He's working to create spiritual pride. Why? Because he knows the scripture. God will resist you when you move into that pride. There will be a, a ceiling. That comes. You can't listen to that voice. You need to recognize that voice is not God. 
that voice to self-promote, that, that voice that puts you against somebody else, that voice of suspicion. It's the voice of the enemy trying to bring division into the church and to get you to think that somehow you did it. Look at chapter 4, verse 10. We, we see this again. He's, he's brought, Peter's brought before the Sanhedrin. And now he says, verse 10, chapter 4, Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He's still giving the glory to Jesus. Now, number seven. The mystery of healing. Yes, there's all these wonderful passages that I've talked about. But yet, even in the scripture itself, there is this mystery that sometimes we just want to ignore it. We don't want to talk about it. Well, we don't like to even use any words that seeming like, like I have this message I didn't teach on the agony of defeat. <laughs> and certain parts of the church, has come, they, they can't stand that word. And they said... We, we don't have any defeat. We're always victors and we're always victorious. And, you know, it's like it doesn't line up with some of the all the, all the time positive confessions. And, and Listen, positive confessions are wonderful. They're better than negative confessions. But if you get to the point that you can't say, would you pray for me? I'm sick because somebody's going to say, that's a negative confession. You shouldn't say that. Then how can he ask for prayer and be honest? And it's, it's, it's a trap, I believe. And there really is times that it feels like defeat. At least in that situation. And I think we see it in the scripture. And I, I've actually heard people say, if the apostle Paul had the revelation of faith that we do today, he would, that man would have been healed. I tell you, I think Paul's revelation of the gospel came from Jesus Christ. And if you think your revelation of the gospel is better than his revelation of the gospel, you need a real big pill <laughs> for humility, <laughs> to help your humility. Because when you think you're understanding the gospel and the faith is stronger and better than the apostle Paul, <laughs> you have entered into a spiritual pride that is pretty, pretty bad. All right, Luke 5, 17. We're talking about the mystery of healing. Luke 5, 17. It's the last uh, sentence of verse 17. That, and the power, this is about Jesus, not about Peter, not about John, not about Paul, it's about Jesus. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. That's one of the most mysterious verses for me. How do we interpret that? How does that make sense? And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Perhaps it really is true what Jesus said in John 5. That in my interpretation of what he's saying is based upon Philippians 2. That he never laid aside his deity, but he laid aside some attributes of his deity. For example, in his incarnation, he no longer can be omnipresent. It's impossible to be omnipresent when you're incarnate in a body. Can't be everywhere at once. When he asks questions... What is it? Because he chose in his humanity to win this battle in his humanity as Adam had lost it in his humanity while he was fully God yet fully man. This understanding of the incarnation is very difficult. Christians have struggled with it for years. Could it be true? He said, I can do nothing of myself. I can only do what I see the Father do. Because that was the plan. That he would win the battle in his humanity. And yet in every attribute of, of his moral attribute. It, it's like he was the one human being. So born of the Holy Spirit. Conceived of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. In whom the fullness of the deity dwelled. As Paul said. And yet he chose. 
in order that I might be the author and the pioneer of your salvation. I'm going to show you what a human being can be and do when it's fully what I want them to be, totally obedient to me and totally yielded to God and empowered by the Spirit. I want to show you what the ideal human life can be when you too are moving by the power of the Spirit that's going to be poured out upon you. And so I'm not going to choose, I'm choosing, I'm choosing to hide my omnipotent power that's given to me and do everything I do in my humanity by the power of the Holy Spirit so I am your model. Could it, I bless you in Jesus' name, could it possibly be when he said, and the Spirit of the Lord was present for him to heal, that that wasn't always the case? Because it wasn't always in the will at that time? There's a mystery to that, but to make it even more important, turn to 2 Timothy 4.20, and I think we're going to be able to enter, end close to being on time. 2 Timothy 4.20. And, and I don't want us to make this the norm when this is the exception more than the norm. Let's not turn the exception into our norm. Let's recognize that this should be our exception rather than our norm. But we got to recognize it's in Scripture. Do you ever wonder how the Apostle Paul felt who led the greatest revival in the New Testament at Ephesus, where the anointing of God was so strong that they could take sweatbands and aprons and clothing that he was working with and take them to the sick and the demons would, 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 would run away and sickness would be healed just by such an anointing on his body that even just some material that had touched his body was carrying that anointing. Can you imagine what it would be like to know that that has happened? And then you have to write in 2 Timothy 4.20, Erastus stayed in Corinth and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Who's Trophimus? It's one of his apostolic team. This is the verse where some people have said, if Paul would have had the faith teaching we have today, that wouldn't have happened. I don't believe it. That's true. I believe Paul understood faith. But it's in Scripture. Was something wrong? Mystery? Do you think that was hard for Paul to understand? Don't you think Paul had prayed? And what about Epaphroditus who almost died but God had mercy? In the Scripture, we have these these little peeks into not everybody that Paul prayed for got healed. Now, do I think Trophimus died of a sickness? I actually don't. And perhaps Trophimus was a little bit like the people who comes on my trips. There was an anointing on the Apostle Paul that gave him a supernatural energy which doesn't mean he was beyond human but when you're walking in a grace and anointing, there's something that sustains you that other people... Huh, I've worn out a lot of guys in their 20s and 30s. After one year, they quit. So I can't keep up with you. <laughs> because there is a special grace, an enablement. People have said, I don't know how you do what you do. I don't either. I give all the glory to God. But there's a, a grace. And others who... Uh, my, my first... 18 years old, one, uh, two years later, I can't go anymore. I'm exhausted. One guy, and he's like 39 years old. He quit and said, it took me a year to recover after traveling with you. <laughs> and I said that to say this. John Mark was following on that first missionary trip, and I think he got so discouraged and so worn out. He's a young man, but he couldn't keep up with Paul and Barnabas, and he got discouraged. He got tired, and he turned back. Could it be possible that trying to keep up with Paul's schedule that he wore himself down? And his sickness was probably, could possibly have been caused by his schedule. 
We have a lot of people on our teams. We say, listen, if you guys begin to get tired, tired, tired. <laughs> if you guys begin to get tired, uh, sleep in. Take a day off. Help us at night. We need you more at night than we do the daytime. But, and be careful to take your naps in the afternoon because I promise you we'll give you two naps a day, one at night and one in the afternoon. <laughs> So don't skip the whole, anytime you get a chance to take sleep, get it. Because our schedule is so hard. And what I've seen is a lot of people don't pay attention to that. And by the time they're into their second week, we begin to find out we got people that are sick on our team that's there to heal the sick. Because they have not taken care of themselves and have not taken the rest they need, and the lack of rest has caused their immune system to become compromised. Could it be possible that's what's going on with Trophimus? I think so. It really could have been. And I think after some rest, he's restored. Last point. What would it be? Eight. I wished I could have ended on seven. It had been the perfect fulfillment of the teaching. But we're starting with a new beginning now in, 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 chat, in, in our point number eight, the motivation for healing. But this is an important point. The motivation for healing. I've already mentioned it, I've alluded to it, that great revival in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts where even the sweat bands were bringing healing. And when we get to verse 17. Now what's happened is there's been, in verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles. A miracle is greater than a healing. A miracle is really in a whole different category than a healing. But what's an extraordinary miracle? It's the only place in the scripture that talks about extraordinary. I, I believe it's the only place in the scripture that I can find, if I can remember right now anyway. Extraordinary miracles. So in verse 11, it talks about extraordinary miracles. It talks about you know, even the handkerchiefs and stuff. And in, in uh, Ephesians, we find that the, the gospel had gone through the whole province of modern-day Turkey uh, um, in just two years. Uh, or actually, it's here. Uh, and then in verse 17, and, and then we got the guys that, uh, dealing with deliverance. And the guys that try to do deliverance by a formula in, in, the, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, and then find out that doesn't work that way. And they're overwhelmed, and the guys, are, they're actually sons of Sceva, seven sons of Sceva, and they're beat up by the demons and, and by this one guy and, and put to flight. And then in verse 17, when this became known, I believe not just this thing about the demons, but the, this, all of this that's preceding chapter 19, the miracles and the warfare and the reality between the difference between those who, who has Jesus in them and those that's just using Jesus' name. It says, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. That, to me, is the greatest, most pure motivation to desire healing. You say, well, wait a minute. What about love? That's awesome. Only thing is, I know that when my family members get healed or my friends get healed, I'm more excited than when your family members or friends get healed. I'm excited both times, but I'm more excited when somebody I know personally and love gets healed. And that's a little bit of selfishness. See, it's, I'm excited for everybody, but I'm a lot more excited when it's somebody I love and know gets healed. So even my love is tainted by some selfishness. Say, well, what, that the church would grow. Oh, God, release your signs and wonders that the church would grow. But I'm more excited when my church grows than when your church grows. <laughs> I'm excited when your church grows, but I'm more excited when my church grows. Which means even in that, there's somewhat tainted by a selfishness. But when it comes down that the name of Jesus would be held in high honor.
When it comes down, oh God, we don't want the name of Jesus to be a swear word in Greenwich, Connecticut. We don't want the name of Jesus to be a swear word in New York City. We want the name of Jesus to be held in high honor. It's all about his name and his reputation, not mine, not anybody else's. God, we, we ask for, there can be many reasons we ask for it, but, and, and one of the things for me, and I'm going to close with this, sometimes I see a lot of healings, and I'm grateful for everything God does, but, but sometimes I realize we've not seen the kind of healing, the kind of miracle that creates this, just this awe factor, and sometimes I'm praying, and I see what God's doing, and Underneath my breath, my prayer is not only that God's name would be held in honor, but my prayer, realizing that Jesus prayed that we, in John uh, 16, I think, 15 or 16, 15, in the Gospel of John chapter 15, Jesus prayed that we'd be fruitful and that God would be glorified and we'd receive glory. Uh, in John and Jesus' uh, upper room discourse, there's this connection between his faithfulness, bringing glory to God, and his desire that we, he said, I've prayed for you. He's prayed for us. He wants us to be fruitful. Now, here's the key, that we'd bear much fruit, fruit that would remain. Okay, bear much fruit, fruit to remain. The fruit of John 15, do not read it as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control of Galatians 5. Because Paul's fruit is the fruit of being. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. As we're living our life. It's an ethical fruit. It's a fruit of being. But in context, Jesus isn't talking about that. It's not one's right and one's wrong. It's an understanding that when they used this word, it was used differently. And to put on, understand fruit in uh, John 15 as what Paul was talking about is to misunderstand what Jesus was saying. Because 14, 12, he, sees, he says, and just look, look up at chapter uh, 14, 15, and 16 of John. It's the upper room discourse. He knows he's going to go to the cross the next day or the, by morning. He knows what's ahead of him, and he wants to make sure that his disciples get what he thinks is some of the most important teachings he can make. So some of the richest teachings of the whole scriptures, John 14, 15, 16. And look up in your concordance in those chapters the word do. Just a little do. John, D-O, D-O. John 14, 12. Anyone who believes in me will do what I have done. And greater things than these shall he do because I'm going to the Father. If you look up these actions, this doing in John 14, 15, and 16, then you realize that the fruit he's talking about in John 15 is the fruit of the doing, not the fruit of the being. Now, that doesn't mean the being fruit is not important because he talks about obedience to him. Uh, if, you, if you love me, you will obey me. So there's this ethical side in that obedience to revelation. But the fruit is about what we will do in his name that brings him glory. So sometimes, now here's my point. Sometimes I'm praying, I see things, I'm preaching, I'm thankful. God, thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for every healing that's taking place. And I'll say, but Lord, you're worthy of more than this. You're worthy of more glory than you're getting right now. These, this level of healing is, is not bringing you all the glory I want you to receive. God, there is more you're Name, Jesus, is worthy of more glory. God, open the eyes of the blind. Let the cripple walk. Cause the deaf to see. Let there be miracles take place so that he gets a greater glory. Some people think that those of us who believe in the gifts are self-centered and selfish. And it's not about our reputation. And it's not 
It's, 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 about, it's not about our glory. It's about his. Amen. So I would say to the parts of the church that just think this stuff doesn't happen anymore and it's not important, it's self-centered. I would say, how can you believe that? And then saying, glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. How does he glorify it? By what he does. To sing glorify thy name and not understand the number one way in scripture, I did a word study on this, that he glorifies his name is through what, is, what he does. Then if we really are concerned that he be glorified, that he receive all the glory that he's worthy of, then we must be concerned that we as his people come to a place of obedience that we can hear him and have revelation that, reduce, that releases faith, that brings in the greater glory that comes through greater healings and miracles. All right, I'd like everybody that stood up during this sermon to check your body out. And if uh, you are 80% or more better, I want you to stand up and wave your hands like this. So check it out first and have one. See if there's any more that were healed. You're at least 80% better. You just uh, wave your hands over your head. So we have one or two that happened out of about five that, that stood up. Uh, and it happened just by the teaching of the word. I want to encourage you that as you teach, you should believe that God will honor his word Amen. and people will be healed just by the teaching of the word. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. And we thank, we thank you for your Logos, and we thank you for your Rhema that Logos tells us about. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you would give us a hunger and a faith and an understanding of your ways that we would see in our churches things happen, that people walk away and say, surely God is in their midst, and you receive glory the name of Jesus would be held in high honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.